There is nothing like Elevation Nights. And we have added three special summer dates. We are coming your way. Tell them where we're gonna be. I'm so excited about this. So on July 19th, we're gonna be in Savannah, Georgia. On July 20th, Greenville, South Carolina. And July 21st, Nashville, Tennessee, we're coming. Did you hear the lady? That's very soon. You gotta get your tickets right now so we can worship God, preach His Word. Everybody's coming. You better be there. I'll see you Elevation Nights. Here comes the Word of God. Go to elevationnights.com and get your tickets and then to the message. Let's hear the Word. Let's go back to our scripture in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 3. If you're seated, Stand real quick for the Word of God. All of a sudden, put that little phrase in the chat if you're joining us online, or look at the person next to you and say, all of a sudden. The scripture that we were singing about a little bit and by the way, that song is not released, so no, you can't get it. I guess if you screen record it, I can't stop you, but if you put it on YouTube, we will take it down because it's not out yet. And the scripture, one of the scriptures that we were singing there in 2 Kings chapter 3, pretty amazing Bible story. I would say one of my top 10 favorites. It, it, it really, I want to go to verse 13, y'all. I gave him verse 13 just in case that we need it for context. Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, Surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. And this is what I was preaching about a little bit last week. But now bring me a musician. Then it happened. Somebody shout, then. then. When? Then. When the musician began to play, then it happened. When the musician played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus says the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. Just start pointing to everything in your house right now and say, everything around me gets to drink from this blessing. And this is, watch, a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Also, you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city and shall cut down every good tree and stop up every spring of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came. Ooh, suddenly. You heard it? You like that? You like that sudden stuff? We're going to talk about that sudden stuff today. Suddenly water came by way of Edom, and the land was filled with water. So it's kind of appropriate that I didn't get to my second point last week because my first point was you'll know when you need to. And then my second point, check this out, how ironic is this that I didn't get to this point? My second point was it will flow when it's supposed to. Isn't that crazy? The part I didn't get to that I was supposed to say was it will flow when it's supposed to. And guess what? I couldn't preach it until right now because this is the word that God wants spoken in this moment. Somebody shout, it will flow when it's supposed to. High five five people on your way to your seat. Say, let it flow. 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 
Let it flow. It's not Christmas time. Not let it snow. Let it flow. Let it flow. Suddenly, um, kind of reestablishing something that I said last week. Say it a little different here and get it up the top. By the way, I want you to understand something about all of the things that you see in life that just seem to come out of nowhere. They don't come out of nowhere. Most of the stuff that we recognize all of a sudden flows from something that wasn't all of a sudden. Most, not all, of the stuff that we recognize all of a sudden flows from something that wasn't all of a sudden. When I stood in front of the mirror about 20 years ago and realized that Holly had made me fat in our first year of marriage, <laughs> my realization that my waistline had gone from a collegiate 38 or 30, 32 to a first year of marriage 30, 38, that six sizes didn't happen suddenly. That six size expansion project on my stomach wasn't sudden. But I did walk in front of the mirror one day with my shirt off and suddenly realized. So, most of the stuff that we recognize all of a sudden, wow, I look more pregnant. My wife is not pregnant. And if any of us is going to be pregnant, it needs to be her, but this is, this is bad. So the way I am wired, I went on a sudden Atkins diet, and it was delightful because through bacon, peanuts, and the power of Diet Coke, I got it back down slowly, not suddenly. And so just kind of saying it in a playful way that most of the stuff that we recognize all of a sudden flows from something like a steady diet of pasta, Doritos. I didn't suddenly eat 700 bags of Doritos. I just ate two, two, two a day for a year. And so when we shout about suddenly, we want to take just a moment to recognize that while certain things come into our life all of a sudden that are desirable, other things, I could call these the other suddenlies. It's where you wake up and realize, all of a sudden, I don't like the person that I'm living with anymore. All of a sudden, this thing in my life has gone from something that I can control to something that I can't. All of a sudden, I'm drinking not just for the sake of winding down, but getting through each day. Suddenly, something that was helpful to me, all of a sudden, it feels like something that is holding me. Now, I don't want to be negative about this beautiful scripture in 2 Kings 3 because it is such an exciting scripture, but understanding that we will often find ourselves in sudden situations that were created through gradual decisions can help us to go back in our lives and allow the Holy Spirit of God to begin to reverse some of the things that our routines created. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to me about the things all of a sudden in our lives that He can change, but it has to start somewhere. So if there is something in your life, like these kings in this passage that I read to you, the, the king of the northern kingdom, the king of the southern kingdom, and the king of Edom, have all gathered together, and on their way to a war, they run out of water, and they have marched seven days through the desert, and suddenly they realize, we need a word from God or we're not going to make it. We need God to intervene or we are not going to survive. And they realize that suddenly, but what had started before their moment of realization was subtle. Hmm. It was a turning away from God that resulted in them being in a vulnerable spot. And so a lot of times in my life, I have 
recognized something suddenly that built slowly. One of my buddies told me about a line in a book. I think he said it was a Hemingway book. I didn't read the book, but I like the quote. One character said to the other, how did you go bankrupt? And the other character said, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> How'd you get divorced? Two ways, gradually, then suddenly. A sudden moment to realize something that had started long before, all of a sudden. So most of the stuff that we recognize all of a sudden, that's what we were singing a minute ago, all of a sudden, most of the stuff that we recognize all of a sudden flows from something. Maybe it wasn't caused by one thing, but it flows from something that wasn't all of a sudden. And touch somebody next to you and say, it wasn't sudden. It showed up sudden, but it wasn't sudden. Um, same could be said for success. All right, let's turn this real quick because it feels kind of dark in here. All right, it feels kind of feels kind of negative in here. I want to shift this energy real quick. Um, I'm calling on the God of Jacob, the God of Joel Osteen. I'm going to some positivity in here real quick. All right, success isn't really sudden. Now, if it is sudden, that's troublesome as well because if the success is too sudden, it won't be sustainable. But most success that God gives will take you up the stairs. Very few elevators to this. Our church is called Elevation, but to really grow through this ministry or any ministry through the Word of God, there will be steps that God will use to strengthen you, and they won't all feel like they're going upward. Sometimes it will feel like you are going down, 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 but if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, one scripture said in due time he will lift you up, and the lifting might happen suddenly, but there are layers beneath every sudden lifting that unless you peel them back and see, you will misunderstand the nature of success just like you can misunderstand the nature of struggle. Struggles don't ingrain themselves all of a sudden. They happen slowly, and so do successes. One of my friends was telling me about… Oh, I'll tell you who he was because it would be a little bit better if I make it specific. He's one of the greatest songwriters that I've ever written with. His name is Jason, Jason Ingram. I've written, I don't know, 20, 30 songs with him in the last few years, and I love getting in a room with him because he has this ability to just spit out a bridge for a song that will blow you away. I saw him do it one time. We were writing this one song, and he just goes, You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. And then he goes, or something like that. <laughs> All of a sudden. So when we finished writing that particular song, he looks at me and goes, that's the song that you write 300 other songs to get to that one song. And I realized something about his skill set as a songwriter. Watch me. That what he did suddenly in that moment was the result of stuff that he did steadily. A steady hand brings a sudden blessing. Now, I asked him a little bit more about his story, and he's one of the most successful songwriters, not only one of the best songwriters, but one of the most successful songwriters. He's won Grammys and Dove Awards and probably Stellar Awards, and he's probably on his way to an Emmy or a Tony or an Oscar that I don't know about at this moment. But he told me that when he first started as a songwriter, and I'm going to get back to 2 Kings chapter 3, but just let me get there slowly, and then suddenly, when it hits, it'll mean more, because if it starts slow, when it hits sudden, it'll mean more. When it starts slow and it hits sudden, it'll mean more. I am preaching, and you don't know that I'm preaching. Because if it starts slow, when it hits sudden, it'll mean more, and it can last longer. So is it bad luck, or was it God's design that when he first started writing songs and went to Nashville, every publisher that he met with rejected him in town? 
His wife had quit her job and had moved with him to start his career, and he couldn't find one publisher that said yes. Many of them said, you just don't have it. One woman named Cindy was willing to give him a publishing contract. It wasn't much money, but it was enough to live off of with a newborn baby. So he began to write songs off of that publishing advance from one woman that believed in him. For a year, he wrote. He turned in 150 songs in the first year. At the end of the first year, not one of them had been recorded. Not one had been recorded other than on his demo machine. It was probably like a, a Tascam Porta Studio 414 before we were doing it on our voice memos on our iPhone. I didn't ask him that detail, but it was probably something archaic like that. And even if it wasn't, let me tell the story that way because it makes it better. <laughs> The second year, for some reason, Cindy decided to renew his contract for another year. He wrote 150 more songs. One got recorded. But before you shout about the one that got recorded and you think I'm going to tell you it was I Can Only Imagine and it went on to be a smash movie, it wasn't. That song was put as a secret track. Now, half this room doesn't know what a secret track is because the secret track is not available in the digital age. A secret track was on the compact disc when after the last song had finished playing, it would go about four minutes, and then another song, a throwaway song, a bonus song that nobody ever heard because they turned the CD off. That's where his song went. We got 300 songs, one recorded, and that's a secret track. And in the third year, when he was nominated for a Grammy, a lot of people said, where did this guy come from? Secret to sudden. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites and go out and go, hey, does anybody see me serving? Does anybody see the 300 songs that I wrote? No, we don't want to hear them. They suck. Keep writing those songs. And then maybe one day, if you do it enough in the secret place, I don't know why I'm preaching this hard 20 minutes in, but one day, what is secret? God can make it sudden, but we live in a day where nobody has any time to be shut up in the secret place. Everybody wants the sudden thing, but it is the secret things. That produced the sudden things. Now I feel the Holy Spirit. Now I feel the wind. Now I feel it blowing. Somebody shout secretly, then suddenly. And whether, whether it is our secret struggles that we need to bring to God and say, God, help me deal with this. Help me process this. Help me deal with this with you, just me and you, before something that you could have secretly healed becomes suddenly exposed. God, I want to get this done in the secret place where you can minister, where you can touch, where you can uproot, where you can make it right. Because everything that we realize suddenly started secretly and built slowly a secret track, and the next year he's at the Grammys. And I'm not saying you'll win a Grammy, and I don't even think you'd really care as much as you thought you would if you did. But I am saying that it can happen suddenly. And when it does, when it does, when it does what you have done secretly, will be the treasure of the process. In our story, not only is there a sudden need that they bring the prophets to speak to these three kings who are… I just want to make sure you know the situation. They went through the desert, and they ran out of water, and they're getting ready for a war. And That is definitely familiar to me, is that Sometimes you go through you go through desert seasons on your way to fight battles and what it takes for you to get to the battle takes so much out of you 
that you definitely don't have what it takes to fight the battle. And so the prophet comes and he begins to prophesy, and he prophesies about a few different things, and I'm going to show you the contrast here. He says, first of all, the hand of the Lord came on him, and in verse 16 he said, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches, for thus says the Lord, verse 17, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle and animals, may drink. Now let's break that down a little bit. What is he saying in these two verses? Well, the first thing that he is not saying is what he is seeing. Before we get into what he says, let's get into what he isn't saying. He doesn't say the ground is dry. He doesn't say this, this battle is hopeless. He doesn't say this situation is desperate, although it is. And it makes me wonder if one of the reasons that we get dry inside is because we need to stop saying so much about what we see and start saying more about what God says. The structure of this is really helpful for your daily life because there's what he sees and there's what God says. And twice he says, thus says the Lord. In verse 16 he said it, thus says the Lord. In verse 17 he says, thus says the Lord. Just put that in the comments, thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. And so you might be in a situation where you're like, this is terrible, but thus says the Lord. This is painful, but thus says the Lord. Are you teaching us to live in denial? No, I'm just teaching you not to live in dryness. Because it only makes it feel drier to drive down and dig down deep into the things that you see when what you see doesn't match what God says. Now, this is where I lose a lot of people, and I can always feel I lose a lot of people here because they think this is the abracadabra, hocus pocus part of the preaching of the Word of God, and it's not. This is the greatest skill that I would get you to learn in regards to dealing with the disappointments in your life, the dry places in your soul, and even the needs that you have that you tend to meet in all of the wrong ways, is to begin to… Okay, I didn't plan any of this, but this flows how it's supposed to, when it's supposed to, and I told you to let it flow, so I'm going to let it flow. This is… Thus says. That's a shift I want you to begin to make. This is. Thus says. Both are important. The this is enables you to deal with where you are. The thus says, when you get a word from God and hold on to it and believe God for it and walk in it and work with it, the thus says the Lord is what gets you from this is to what can be. And I believe there are some people who are sitting under this message today who have been so stuck in this is that you forgot thus says. When you don't feel like a conqueror and you make yourself a victim and you forget that he called you a victor, it is just a matter of time before you feel very dry. So this is the switch you have to make. This is unfair victim language. Thus says the Lord, he will repay me double for my trouble and no weapon. I can't do it. No organ yet. No organ yet. Steady your hand. Because the thing about God is, he will tell you to do crazy stuff that completely contradicts what makes sense in your logical mind. I'll prove it. This is what the Lord says. Everybody say, thus says the Lord. 
Verse 16, put it up on the screen because they won't believe it if I don't show it to them with their own eyes. Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. A ditch for what? It's dry. I don't need a ditch in a dry place. Not yet. But thus says, now B3. This is a getting ready moment for you. Thus says the Lord. I love the word of God. How about you? Because it's what God uses to dig in my spirit to prepare me to receive what he's bringing by his hand into my life. And no digging doesn't feel good. Not for the digger or the dirt. Trust me, I know. Don't you remember my story from a few weeks ago? How I used to dig graves for dogs? Did you hear that story? Were you here? I had a job digging graves for dogs and cats, and I, that prepared me for ministry. I believe it did. It prepared me for parenting. I told Abby the other day, I said, hey, I want you to memorize this so if a boy ever wants to date you, here's your opening speech. Hey, before you date me, you just need to know my dad has experience doing weddings and digging graves because I'm that dude. So tell him, oh, when he shows up, before we start this relationship, you need to know, either way it goes, my dad can do what needs to be done. I'm the man for the job. So I told her that when you start dating in about 35 years, tell your first boyfriend that when you turn 50. Now listen, it's amazing what God speaks. He says, there's going to be there's going to be water flowing from the land of Edom. Isn't that a crazy place for water to flow from? The same desert that they marched through to begin with. Isn't it crazy how sometimes God will bring the greatest blessings from the driest places? The same desert that you just marched through for 7 days and became dehydrated as you did is the same place that the blessing is going to flow from. Thus says the Lord. The same comfort with which God is comforting you through this crisis in your life is going to be the same comfort that you are going to give to others when you get to your place of service. The same lessons that you're learning through this breaking seasons are going to be the same lessons that turn into blessings for the people that you help when you get through it. That's amazing. It's amazing what he told him to do, dig ditches in the valley. It's debatable whether he meant it literally or figuratively. I really don't care. It speaks to a mindset for me. Whether they really started digging all night to get ready for the rain or whether he was just kind of saying it like, fasten your seatbelt, it's going to be a bumpy ride. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is an actual seatbelt involved. It's, it's a saying. And I think maybe dig ditches in the valley was a saying, but I know for a fact it was an expectation. And he tells him to do that. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water. He also tells him what God intends to do. The thing that he doesn't say that I found almost as interesting as what he did say is how it would happen and when it would happen. That's interesting. Because if you went seven days without water, that's long enough to be desperate. Seven days is a long time. I don't even know how they've stayed alive these seven days if they've passed through their rations, but we're talking about water, not Wi-Fi. 
How many of you think that you would go on a fast seven days without Wi-Fi would be enough to drive you to sackcloth and ashes? Just seven days without an internet connection. We have to really realize how weak they were in this moment to really appreciate the value of the word that God gave. Because there's always this part of us that will listen to a little faith message like this and go, yeah, but my situation, uh-uh. We're talking about water. No water. And I don't care how many awards you win. I don't care how many great things you accomplish. I don't care what number your net worth says. No water? It's over. That's how bad it is. And so if it's that bad and God's word comes, the way we would expect to read this verse is, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha, and he began to prophesy. And when the hand of the Lord came on Elisha, and he began to prophesy, make this valley full of ditches, all of a sudden, water came. That all of a sudden, the thing that I need will be released in my life. But the Bible doesn't say that the water suddenly came. The Bible says that an instruction was given. Now, sometimes before the intervention of God, there is an instruction to you. And I'm wondering, what is God calling you to dig today? I thought about this sermon from multiple levels. My buddy who wrote 300 songs, who showed up and dug every day. My friend who sold a business for over $100 million last year, who had to go back to being a substitute teacher and was waking up at 5 in the morning and going to sleep at 2.30 in the morning to build his company in the beginning in order to get to the point where he sold the company. When I see somebody who God did something great for them, now I've learned to ask a secondary question. Not only what God did for them, that's my first question. The second question that I ask is, I wonder what they dug for God to do that. I wonder what God dug for them to be able to have that kind of relationship. When I see families that are really happy, and I don't just mean like happy in the picture. I mean like families that are really together and they've survived some tough seasons and one of their marriages ended and one of their kids is in a bad spot, but they're praying for it and all coming back around. I don't just wonder what God did for them anymore. I wonder, what did they have to dig through to get to this kind of family strength? And you do yourself a real favor. When you see somebody that God did something great for and you want God to do that for you, if you get a chance, ask them, what did you have to dig for God to do that? Because the water came suddenly. And if you only showed up in the sunlight of the next day, you would have mistakenly believed that the water just came when the word came. And if you just think that everybody who's blessed and everybody who has peace and everybody who's free and everybody who's walking in a measure of the favor of God and everybody who has influence, if you just think that God did it, then you miss the point. God did it when they dug it. That's why I love this passage. Because it means that God is sovereign. He did it. Nobody else can make it rain. Nobody else can tell the sun come up now. Nobody else can drive back the darkness but God. God did it, but they dug it. God didn't write 300 songs for Ingram. If he did, all of them would have been smash hits. They would all been number one. First day out, can you imagine God writing a song? It would dominate the charts. 
You can dance to it. You can sway to it. You can cry to it. You can laugh to it. No, he wrote 300 songs. He dug it. And God did it. In that order. It didn't flow the moment the prophet spoke about it. Thus says the Lord, water flow. No, water will flow when you dig. <laughs> dig where? This valley. Wait, a valley that's dry? A valley that's low? A valley that's painful? A feeling that I can't shake? Yes, the lower and the deeper the valley, the more the water it can hold. I am telling you that this is not your breaking. This is your breakthrough. This is it. This valley. Shout. Thus says the Lord. High five at least three people and say, thus says the Lord. This is a valley, but thus says the Lord. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. Thus says the Lord. He's making a table right now. Yeah. And the only thing the devil can do since he can't take the word of God away from you is to get you so weary and discouraged that you stop digging because it's dry. You can't dig. You're dry. That's why I'm digging. Because I'm dry. That's why I'm praising. Because I'm dry. That's why I'm doing it. Because I'm dry. Digging or drought? Digging or drought? You will have to decide in this moment of your life, digging or drought? I'll be digging. Because I did drought. And I didn't like it. I threw a pity party. Nobody RSVP'd. They surely didn't bring presents. I did bitterness. I did bitterness. I got down to the bottom of the bitterness, and guess what I found? Dry. Once I drank all that bitterness, I was dry. I did blame. Y'all want me to dig, or do y'all want me to dance up here? I could just dance up here. I can just dance up here. See, I notice a lot of preaching is like we're dancing around what's really happening rather than digging through what's really causing it. And so this happens in parts, right? The, the word comes suddenly. The musician started playing, and the word came suddenly. But since we talked about the steady hand of the musician last week who played the harp, we should also talk about the steady hand of the diggers who held the shovels. That's where sudden blessings come from. Constant digging. Are you saying I have to work my way into a relationship with God? Because I got set free from that because I grew up in that church and that burned me out, man. So don't you start telling me I got to read 17 chapters of the Bible a day because I tried the 17 chapters of the Bible today plan and I hated the Bible because I couldn't have pronounced Methuselah and Methizophek and all these people that you had me reading about and it got real, real boring in Leviticus. I'm not talking about working your way to God. I'm talking about digging your way to water. Where the grace can flow, where the joy can flow. And let me tell you when it's going to flow, when it's supposed to. When it's supposed to. Let me tell you when they're going to take you off the secret tracks and bring you to the stage, when they're supposed to. And let me tell you what you can do in the meantime until it does, because I think a lot of us are really confused about what we need to surrender in our lives. We don't need to surrender the desires God has put in our heart if God put them there. What we need to surrender in this season of our life 
is the way we thought it was supposed to go. Did you say say that again? All right. Just for you. Let go of how you thought it was supposed to go. And while you're at it, let go of when you thought it was supposed to get there. Because the issue isn't will God, it's when God. It's not will God, it's when God. And it doesn't just depend on what He wants to do, it depends on what you are willing to do until God does. I shared with one of the people that I mentored the other day, they were needing clarity. And I said, the issue isn't whether God will reveal this or not. The issue is, what will you do until God does give you clarity? Because if you flail right now, and if you thrash right now, and if you act nasty right now, and if you cope with stuff that's going to put you in a cage later right now, then when God gives you clarity, you won't even be able to act on it because you will be so constrained by the decisions that you made while you were waiting. The issue is not will God. The issue is not his sovereignty. It's your supposed to. Let me ask you a question. When it flows, are you going to be where you're supposed to be? In the valley? Digging ditches in the valley, transporting. You know, that's a lot of times what parenting is. It's just taking your kids back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And in certain seasons, they won't talk to you. How was your day? Fine. If you get a fine out of them, that's a grade A response. That is a that is a premium response in this season I'm talking about, and then they're going to be in your room at 12.30 in the morning. Now they want to talk. You're asleep. And part of being a parent is being able to flow with all of that, because you know, if you pick them up and drop them off enough, eventually they open up enough, and you get to have the conversation. But if you don't show up when they say nothing, when they open up, you won't be there. Everything is like that. Everything is like that. Everything God did in my life was something that I was digging in a dry place when he was doing it. And the same thing for Holly. The same thing for Holly. Usually when we meet people and we're meeting them for the first time and they're a part of the ministry, they'll go, "Oh, Pastor Stephen, hey Holly." Doesn't bother me a bit. Doesn't bother me a bit. I'm like, I like her more than I like me too. Hey, trust me, I'm in her fan club. I'm the president. Would you like a picture of her? And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but just to make a point that I remember when Holly felt completely useless in this ministry. I remember the season when the kids were very little, that I would take them out on a Wednesday night and she would invite maybe like 12 women. I don't know if it would be smaller or larger than that, but she would have them into our home, and she would walk them through a Bible study. But it wasn't just a Bible study because she didn't really feel like she had that much to teach from the Bible, but she would show them how to cook, how to cook quick meals. Because she would say, when you have little kids, you have to cook quick meals. So I'm going to show you quick meals, stuff you can do real easy, stuff that doesn't take much brain power, stuff that'll take your husband's waist size from a 32 to a 38. That class should have been called Project 38. And so, so I watched it expand like my waistline from when she did the Bible study in our house to then I watched, they said, you need to do that for all the ladies of our church. And she made a little study called Mrs. Better Half. You know how many people I have overheard while they're getting their selfie with her while I'm standing over in the corner sucking my thumb say, it saved our marriage? But it means more to me because I saw where it started real slow. 
and I saw that it was out of her personal dryness of where she could have felt sorry for herself. What do I do? What's my job? What's my value? Where's my Grammy? Where's my Oscar for best supporting role? I watched what she did. And I watched how she did it at such a level. It was almost like a decimal. Like, you know, like you got the number, then the decimal. It's almost like I watched what was behind the decimal move. And I watched God add zeros to it, where it was 10 women, and then it was 100 women, and then it was 1,000 women. I feel God enlarging somebody's vision right now. Not your waistline, your vision, your vision, your vision, your vision, your vision. Come on, can you see it by the Spirit? Because you won't see wind, and you won't see rain. And nobody came to her with a publishing in advance and said, would you make a study about wifedom? She never got the wifedom publishing advance. But when the pandemic hit and everybody was trapped in their homes, hating each other, hating each other a little bit, on each other's nerves, we were taking a walk and I said, you know what you've got? Better half. I want you to release better half into the world right now so we can help families get through this challenging time. And she did that. And she did that. And it wasn't 10 anymore. It wasn't even 100. It wasn't 1,000. It wasn't just our church. It was all over the world. I watched as women all over the world were gathered saying, can we drink some of that water? that you started digging for a decade ago. That's why God did it, because you dug it. You dug it, God did it. You dug it, God did it. This is gonna be your testimony, so practice. I dug it, God did it. I dug it, God did it. Too heavy, flow with me. You dug it, God did it. You dug it? God did it. You dug it? God did it. That's what you're going to be telling people a little bit from now. I had a secret track after 300 songs. I had a secret prayer life. I had a secret reading plan. I had a secret ambition, but I surrendered it to him, and I gave up on what others were going to think, and I got serious about service. I dug it. God did it. I dug I'm getting happy now. I dug it. God did it. We're going to be looking back on something not many days from now. So I'm talking about I dug it. God did it. Now let's get into this a little bit. Say, when I dig it, God can fill it. Not when I feel it, when I dig it, when I don't feel it, God will fill it. And this, my friend, is the word of the Lord. Why is it not here yet? Imagine the digging that took place with people who were already dehydrated. Because they dug all night. They waited all night. That's a long time to dig with nothing to drink. Trust me, I've dug. I've dug. Come on, take it from the grave digger. I've dug. And I'm not filling a valley with ditches, and I had better tools. So digging while you're dry, right? That sounds so inspirational, but it can be so difficult. So they need water right now. Why didn't God make it flow the moment Elisha spoke it? Why do we have to go all the way to verse 20 for the water to come? I'm going to tell you why. Because the sun wasn't up yet. The sun wasn't up yet. Some of the things that make you want to give up 
and think it's never coming, the sun isn't up yet. The sun isn't up yet. Say it out loud. The sun isn't up yet. The sun isn't up yet. Imagine them digging all night, and they're dry, and they're desperate, and in many ways, they're defeated. They've already expressed that the Lord has brought us here to hand us over, so they've completely lost their confidence, but they're digging anyway. Verse 17 says, Thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water. So every time they check to see, has it happened yet? Somebody says no. I want to talk for a moment about what to do when you're navigating a no. Is there wind yet? No. Do you feel the mist yet? No. No, I'm not talking about a thunderstorm. Do you even feel a drop yet? No. Are you? This some people love to ask me. Are you ready to preach? I never answer that with a complete yes. Because the truth of the matter is, there's no real way to be ready to release the word of God. It flows when it's supposed to. God gives me what I need as I preach it. So shall it be in your life. I want you to receive this. I want you to receive this. I don't know if you're getting it. Every time they asked, did God do it yet, while they're digging, it was a no. And sometimes when you get enough no's, you make no your emotional home. No wind. No rain. No body to talk to about this. No one that you really trust. No end in sight to this battle. No good news lately. I can make it really good. No deposits in the account, no matter how many times a day you check it. You ever just check wondering if something happened overnight? Like maybe. I don't know. God is big. Maybe the bank made an error. Maybe Y2K will be 23 years late and they just all get wiped out. Let me just check this one more time. Nope. I see you refreshing your phone. No. Maybe they text. No. Well, maybe they. No. And the way you negotiate that no, which is a type of value of its own, isn't it? It's so important. Do you make that no your home? Or do you dig through it to find what God will do? If you don't let the no that life has told you become the final word over your life. In verse 20, we get a very different word. And what we've basically done is we've gone from no wind. Everybody say no wind. No wind. Say it out loud, say no wind. Put it in the chat. Say no wind. The the refreshing that you wanted didn't come. The momentum that you wanted didn't come. The the how many how many can relate to this? Just put a, a, a raised hand up in the room or in the chat. I don't care how you do it, but put it up. Say yeah. No wind. I don't feel it right now. No rain. That's the resource that they need. So sometimes it's going to come in this way. You are not going to get the feeling that you want, the resource that you want, and it's going to be a no. Now the way that you negotiate this no has everything connected to what is next. It does not just depend on what God can do. It depends on what you will do until God does. That's what it depends on right now. What will you do until God does? And I've got another confession of faith that God gave me, and it might be for somebody that I may have doubts. And I may have disappointments, and I may have a lot of no's. There may be 300 of them. There may be 300 more. There may be rejections in my futures and failures in my future. I'm sure that there are. If I keep living, there will be. There may be people who don't like me. There may be people who turn on me. 
There may be dryness in my future, and I don't know exactly how God is going to do this, but I'll tell you what I have decided in my spirit, that I'll be digging until God does it. That's all I can control. That's all I can do. I can't make it rain. I can't make people change their minds. I certainly can't control things that are beyond the sphere of the domain that God has given me. I can't make that person love me. I can't make that person like me. I can't make this situation change. I can't make them see my value. But I know one thing. I'll be digging until God does because he knows. Somebody shout, he knows. I don't, but he knows. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. He knows. He knows what he's going to do, who he's going to do it through, at the exact time he's going to do it, and until he shows me how it's going to happen, I'll be digging, put this on the screen, until God does it. So I believe he's going to give me the joy. I believe he's going to give me the second chance. I believe he's going to show me the next chapter. But until he does, I'll be digging. Because guess what? When they dug it, God did it. Shout it. When they dug it, God did it. So give me my next slide. This is what I mean. I'll be digging until God does. That's why I dug. Because he put something in me. That's why I dug. Because he has something for me. Don't you get it? I has not seen and ear has not heard and neither has it entered into your heart what God can do. So what you gonna do? I'll be digging until God does. And if it takes another night, and if it takes another year, and if it takes another prayer, and if it takes another song, and if it takes another setback, that's all right. I'm digging down deep. I'm built up strong. I will not fall. High five everybody you feel like high five and say dig till he does it. Dig till he does it. Dig till he does it. You need water? All right. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy, joy. Put it in the chat with 14 O's. Joy. You can dig a ditch right now. Open your mouth and praise him. Verse 20, we went from no to watch this. Now, that's just no with something after it. Now, 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 now. I'm digging now for what I will see later. Now. I need three people I can preach to. God said, no is just now waiting for what's next. When you get done digging, you know how strong your foundation's going to be. And when it gets there, you'll be ready for it. That's why I'm getting my spending under control. So when God wants to make me a steward to bless more people than just my family, I, I, I started budgets when we were broke. You didn't hear a word I just said for the last hour. 
I started my budget when we were broke. Because if God moves the zero to the other side of the decimal, what am I going to do with it? That's a ditch. Now, there is a decision to be made on your part, and then there is a destiny that has been created in God's heart. Because the Bible said, What? Now it happened. When? In the morning. Why did God wait all night? Why didn't God make it happen right when you needed it? Why? Well, the Bible said, Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly, but it's not sudden. We've been digging all night. It looked sudden if you were watching it, but it was steady if you were digging it. Isn't that the truth? Suddenly water came by way of Edom, and the land was filled with water. I still don't know why would God wait until the morning when they were about to die through the night, but I read the next verse. Watch what happened next. When all the Moabites, that's the enemy, heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all the enemies who were able to bear arms and older were gathered. They stood at the border. They thought they were about to kill the people of God. But get ready to shout. Shout now. Now. No, no, no. I want you to shout the word now. Now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I'll be clearer in the future. When they saw, oh, 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 by the way, Edom means red. When they saw the water on the other side, the enemies, they thought it was blood because it was red. Why was it red? Because the sun came up. When the amber sun kissed the sudden flood, it looked like blood to the enemy. So watch what they did. Next verse, please. And they said, This is blood. The kings have surely, surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoil. So the enemy rushes in, but it wasn't blood. It was the meeting of the flood and the sun that came together. So I picture God all night long that the prophet spoke, There will be a flood. And God is saying, Not yet, flood. The sun isn't up yet. See, you can't flow just yet, because when the sun comes up, the sun is going to hit the flood in just the right way, at just the right time, to confuse your enemy, at just the right place, at just the right time. And God says, it will flow when it's supposed to. You're right on schedule. God has not abandoned you. The sun is coming up over your life, and God says it's time for you to dig again. It's time for you to sing again. It's time for you to rejoice again. Let's take 20 seconds and do it now. Begin to praise Him. All of a sudden, like a flood, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, God said, Son, you can rise. Waters, you can flow. I release healing in your life. I release joy in your life. I release freedom in your life. Now, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, but even if it doesn't, I'll be digging until he does it. All of a sudden, Woo! all of a sudden, but even if it doesn't, I'll still be digging until he does it. All of a sudden. Sun works on a cycle, see? All of a sudden. But even when it doesn't, 
I'll still be digging until he does it. All of a sudden, catch this. All of a sudden, leaving him. But even if he doesn't. Hey, thank you for watching the Elevation Church YouTube. I want you to subscribe. That way you can know when we go live and post new content. Make sure to leave me a comment. Let me know what spoke to you today, where you're watching from, and what we can pray for you about. And if you'd like to support the ministry financially, you can click the Give button now and help us continue reaching people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.